And there's folks you know that really need the Lord right now in whatever way. And let's take a moment just to pray for these and for the needs on your heart too. Father, we thank you for the open invitation that invites us to come and cast our cares on you because you care for us. And so, Lord, we pray now. Lord, I pray for these uh, names that are here on these post-its. I pray for the lives, Lord, that are represented for the needs that are here. And I thank you, Lord. Your promise is to supply all of our needs. We commit them to you today. And pray, Lord, whatever that need may be, may it be spiritual or practical or emotional. Lord God, we pray, Lord, that you would just meet each one of these needs. And Father, around this worship center today, Lord, where there are folks that are, whose hearts are heavy for those they care about, Lord, we commit those to you. And Father, we thank you. You're a God who hears and who answers prayer. And Lord, as we turn to your word, we ask you to help us to hear what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, hey, welcome, by the way, to those that are visiting with us today. If you look around you, or those of you that are regulars, if you look around you, you will see that quite a number of our folks were able to make the shift from the 930 service to the 11. So that has freed up space. That's good news, isn't it? That means there's room for more folks to come in. So keep inviting, keep asking. And uh, we were really pretty jammed in this service and had plenty of space in the second. So um, things are balancing out there, which means we've still scope for others. So do, do invite folks to come, and especially for this series we're doing through uh, the next six weeks, Not a Fan. Now, six years ago, pretty near to this time, we started a series called Not a Fan. It was this series. And we did it, and it goes like this, that on a Sunday with, uh, in the teaching, I launch a theme for the week, and then midweek, there is a video, which is actually, we saw a clip of it today. It's a whole story that lasts for six weeks. And we watch the video, it's 30 minutes a week, and then afterwards, we break up into groups and talk about what was... Um, what was brought up during the course of the story that we were watching. And to guide us through it, there is a journal called Not a Fan that I know a lot of you have bought already. And we do have some, uh, in fact, we ordered extra supplies for this week. They are uh, they're available at the table just outside here after service. They're $10 each. And the journal really starts with effect from today. So day one in the journal is uh, we'll... we'll look for your reflections on what you're hearing here this morning. Now, this isn't the kind of thing, okay, in the morning, okay, what I got to do to today? Okay, read that bit, yeah, that's good. Uh, this actually gives you something to look at and think about in the morning. Then it gives you a midday something, and then an evening something. So this is a book you're going to be having with you over the next six weeks. So if you didn't get one, I want to encourage you to get one. And then after you go out of here today, sometime today is a good time to actually make a start on day one of the journal. So we did this six years ago. So why are we doing it now? Well, we established uh, a few weeks ago that many of you were not here six years ago. And then we recognized the fact that we don't all remember things that well. All right, sorry. Some of us don't remember things that well. And it was a series that made a major impact. So we felt coming into 2019, six years ago was, was going to be a, an interesting year for us, the start of that year. We anticipated moving into this building that year. We were still in the movie theater in Ronkonkoma doing church. And we anticipated moving to the building. So we knew that was going to be a special year. Here we are, here we are today. Uh, still kind of in the early stages of 2019. And I anticipate that this is going to be a remarkable year. Uh, we saw God do some great things, and we ended 2018 uh, really strong in a very positive way. Perhaps the greatest demonstration was our celebration Sunday, the last Sunday of the year, when we baptized 29 people here, which was fantastic. Praise God. And uh, we'd baptized folks just three months before, but in that quarter, there were 29 people who were ready for baptism. I anticipate this is going to be a great year, and this is going to help us in that direction. 
So we're kicking off the series, Not a Fan, and this morning's question is, are you a fan or are you a follower? Are you a fan or are you a follower? A number of years ago, I, I lost a lot of weight, and as most of you know, a lot of you know the story, I, I did it with Weight Watchers. And um, after I got to a weight I was comfortable with, I was asked if I would be interested in, in leading some meetings for Weight Watchers, and I said, yeah, I would. Um, because I felt that would keep me connected, because I don't know about you, I'd lost weight before and regained it. Right? And it always brings its friends with it when it comes back, right? So, uh, so I, you know, I wanted to stay focused, so, so I do. I still do it. I still lead some meetings um, for them. And I remember one Wednesday night, I was doing a group, and while I was doing that group, I was writing something up on a flip chart at the front during the meeting, and when I turned around, I saw the regional manager was sitting in the back of the room. She must have come in while I was just writing something on the board. So uh, I saw her, I figured, uh-oh, she's here to critique me and see what I'm up to. So I went through the meeting, and after the meeting, she said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah, sure. Um, she said, I want to ask you a question. How do you see your career with Weight Watchers developing? <laughs> and I said, Maggie, I've got to be honest with you. I don't. I don't. Weight Watchers is not my career. You know what I do. That's my focus. That's my life. This is something I love doing, but it's very much a side item. And she said, well, that's fine. I just wanted to be able to sit in with you and talk about it because I see, you know, there, there's potential for you. It's, it's great, you know, when you're whatever I was then, 50-odd years old, and somebody realizes you've got potential. So that was good. <laughs> that was good. You could make something of yourself yet, you know. Uh, but... but that conversation was the conversation, and you'll see about it in your journal, and you'll hear more about it in the weeks to come. It, it was a conversation that defined the relationship. The DTR conversation. It's something we all do at different times in life. People do it when they start dating, or but well, not normally when you start dating. But there comes a point after a while where one partner uh, summons up the courage to actually say, like, you know, so what do you think? Where are we going with this, right? Uh, I, I, I actually did that day one. Uh, Jill and I met in Bible college. Um, it was an interesting setup. It was a small college, basically just preparing people for ministry. And uh, dating was forbidden. Life was different some years ago. So dating was forbidden. So we weren't allowed to date. But, you know, if you get young people all together, uh, they find ways around rules. And uh, so we had kind of had conversations and we'd kind of, you know, people pass notes and things like that, make sure we didn't get caught by the powers that be. And then we decided we were going to meet one evening uh, in a road, a little country road away from the college. And so there we were. This was our first face-to-face -face kind of meeting, her and I. And, and my opening shot was, I guess we better clear something up first. Nobody gave me any help here. Are you all right? So <laughs> I said, I guess we better clear this up first. I don't know where you see your future preparing for ministry, but I'm going to be a pastor. And if you're planning to go do something totally different, I guess we won't get started. That, that's not a way that I would encourage any person here to endeavor to start a relationship, okay? All right? Um, but it seems to have worked. We'll have been married 50 years at the end of this year. So I guess it worked, okay? Okay, not my recommended pickup line, but whatever, you know. But I did want, right from the start, to define the relationship. Um, because, you know, if you're going to go in one direction in life and I'm going the other, then there's, it's, there's going to be, you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of point in us really getting together. Define the relationship. And what I really want us to do today and over the next few weeks, really, 
is to do just that with Jesus. Define the relationship with Jesus. Now, I appreciate the fact you may be here for the first time today. You may be back in church for the first time in years. And this is like the first date. And you're sitting there thinking, you, you want me right here and now to define? No, I don't. Just relax and listen. You're good. You're good. No pressure at all. But I think it's a good thing for most of us in this room to have a define the relationship talk with Jesus. To really have a look at and take inventory and say, well, where do I stand? Someone once said, life is a constant course correction. A good thing to say, where do I actually stand with Jesus? In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus put this out to his disciples. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, you deny yourself, you take up your cross daily, and you follow me. And, and I know there are some folks here who really welcome this kind of focus because I've talked to you in recent weeks, and you've talked about your desire to strengthen your faith, to develop your relationship with Jesus. You're ready to move past the point from being casual church attender to saying, I really want to have a strong connection with Jesus for myself. Now, some of you might not be, and that's okay. It's a journey, and we're all at different stages. You may be here today because this has become a, a part of your pattern and a part of your weekend, and that's good. You kind of like what goes on here. You maybe like the way we do things. Okay, that's cool. But I do want us to say, I do want us to take the moment today and say, let's define the relationship. And the question we're going to use from the title of this series and of the journal is, are you a fan or are you a follower? Because not everyone who's in church on a Sunday is a follower of Jesus. And I've got to say this, not everyone who has, trusted their, who has trusted Christ as their Savior is necessarily a follower. Fan or follower. So the word fan means an enthusiastic admirer. And, and we're all fans of different things, aren't we? I'm a fan of a certain brand of footwear. I like it. In fact, I was trying to work out what color this logo is. I thought it was a kind of a hot pink, uh, but there seemed to be some debate because if it's hot pink, I've actually got hot pink Converse I could have worn today to match them, but I didn't. I went mellow. Or, or we're fans of sports teams, right? You know, last f Sunday night, some of you will have been watching probably the, the championship games with, with the football, and you'll be fans of particular teams. And, and, and some of you, maybe you were wearing all the gear, or maybe for some of you, you put all your fan gear away when the regular season ended, <laughs> or even halfway through the season. But you know what I mean? You got the gear and you, you, you totally look the part. If I go to watch the Mets play, I've got the cap and I've got the shirt and I've got the Mets backpack and I'm like already here. I'm a fan of the team. I'm never going to play the game. I'm never going to have any responsibility there. But the fact is, I'm there as a fan. I can tell them how to play it. I can cheer when they do well. But actually, I'm never going to have any kind of responsibility like the guys on the field play. So the question of fan or follower is this. Am I someone who enjoys the game or am I somebody who is committed to being a part of it and to make it happen? Because any church has the potential to become a stadium for fans of Jesus. And Jesus never cared about fans. I remember a few years ago when, when kind of Facebook became a, a new thing, it was almost like some folks competition. Um, how many friends you got? Oh, I got so and so. Oh, I passed the I passed five hundred friends today. It's like great. 
I got Facebook friends. I got no idea who they are. So I got logs. No, people send me friend requests, and as long as they don't look like a weirdo or some, you know. Uh, well, some of my friends. Anyway. Um, but no, I, so I check, and if, if I see that we've got a bunch of mutual friends, I think I probably should know this person. <laughs> Right? So it's like, because I know a lot of people. So like, I probably shouldn't know this person, so I accept the friend request, so I've got loads there, you know. So, so, but the thing is this, Jesus wasn't interested in getting a whole bunch of friend requests. He wasn't interested in having a whole ton of fans. Jesus didn't come to make fans. He came to make followers. He came to make followers. And uh, can I just say this? If you're visiting today... When I was thinking about today, it, it might sound like I'm a bit in your face. Um, I tend to be an in your face, up, well, let's say up front kind of person. Is that okay? But I do it in kind of what I like to think of as a, a fatherly way. And yeah, today is, it's, it's a chat about, hey, where you at? Where you at, really? Are you a fan? Or are you a follower? You, you can, you know, you can become just, ju- just a fan in a in a in a church setting. You really can. It's like, hey, I love this stuff. You know, you like the music and you like the relaxed setup. And you know what? I, I can listen to that guy for thirty minutes, or so. <laughs> or you can be a really big fan. You know, you've got U version on your phone. And you can you sing along to the songs and you know all of the songs. In fact, you play some of the songs in your car on a regular basis. You, you, you're a big fan. But let's all of us take an inventory today and look into our hearts and say, yeah, but am I a fan or am I a follower? So to help you... D- help you to really define your relationship with Jesus, there are three questions I'm going to ask you. Don't, don't, don't take offense at the first one. Why are you here? Why are you here? So I quite like baseball, and, and I think when we, when we move to the U.S., you, you'll appreciate all the sports are different here. Uh, and so it was kind of learning new sports, and I was ready to do that. And I guess the first baseball game that uh, I went to after we moved to Long Island was that I I went to watch a Mets game. And so after that, I became a Mets fan. And those of you who support another team, um, you need to be gracious about that. Because it's not an easy life being a Mets fan, okay? So you should be nice to us. So so now and again, Jill and I, Jill and I will go to City Field to watch a game, and uh, we, we go in there. Now, here's the thing. Jill's not a huge fan of baseball, but she enjoys the experience. So we also enjoy the Italian sausage with the peppers and onions uh, and, and, and whatever else the next vendor's coming around with and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's the whole experience, really, of, of everything that's going on on the big screen and everything. Um, but, but she doesn't know as much about the game as, as, as many of you would know. Because it's not, you know, not a huge committed fan of the game, but enjoys the experience. If you read through the Gospels, there are different times in the life of Jesus when he kind of drew a line in the sand and said to people around him, look, are you over there or are you here? And that's what I'm trying to do right now today. There was a time like that in the sixth chapter of John's gospel. A lot of people were following Jesus. There were terrific crowds with him wherever he went. He was working miracles. He had just provided food for over 5,000 people, and he'd used five... Um, um, Five loaves and two fish. Good. Glad you know the story. That's good. All right. So in my head, I'm, in my head, I'm going, was it five fish and two loaves or five loaves? And, thank you. We'll say five loaves and two fish for today. We good? It was a long time ago since we met in Bible college. All right. So that's good. So there's a great crowd there. And here's what it says in John 6 verse 1. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick. 
the main reason that people were following Jesus everywhere was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I wonder what he's going to do next. It was a great show. He just fed all these people with all this stuff. He healed sick people. He did all kinds of stuff. And there was a huge crowd following him. This was exciting. He had never seen anything like this before. They had never seen anything like this before. It wasn't so much for Jesus himself. It was the wow factor. They were there for the show. So, In my best fatherly way, why are you here? Why are you here? I mean, I love the fact that it's a relaxed feel environment in totality. This may become a place for you where you come with friends or where you've made friends. I hope you like the music. I do. I think Tom and the band do a great job. Great job. Our boy band today were wonderful. <laughs> or maybe you're a parent and you're thinking, my children really need some foundation, and you bring them here. And we've got an incredible children's program. Faith does a fantastic job with that. And you're here for the kids' sakes. But that's great for a while, but Jesus challenged his fans to go further. All these people were following him because they liked what they were seeing and they liked what they were hearing and they enjoyed the environment. But then in John 6 and verse 51, here's what Jesus says. This is an interesting statement. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread, ordinary bread, will, sorry, whoever eats this bread, the bread from heaven, will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. That's kind of a weird statement. Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven, right? They'd seen the bread, the ordinary bread he fed 5,000 with. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever buys in to the life that I give for the world, whoever makes my sacrifice a part of their lives, they will live forever. Jesus said, okay, I know you've enjoyed the show, and uh, I know you're loving what's happening. I know you can't wait to see what's next, but there's something way more important here, and that is this. I'm looking for people who will totally buy into who I am, what I'm here for, what I came to do, and who will make that whole thing a part of their lives because they are going to live forever. That's what Jesus was looking for. He didn't want fans. He wanted followers. Now, here's what it says in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples, this was people who were his followers, not the 12, but the wider group of people who were his followers. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Jesus said, I want you to totally buy into who I am and what I'm about. And the Bible says, some say, you know what, this is asking a bit too much. I'm not ready for that. And then here's what it says next. It says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. When it came down to it and Jesus challenged them and said, look, I'm not just... I'm not just asking for you to be around when I'm around. I'm not just asking for you to applaud when things happen. What I'm really looking for is a heart commitment to me as Savior and Lord. And when they heard that, they said, "Ah, no, you know what? I'm not ready to go there yet. I'm not ready to go there yet. And a lot of them went home. When Jesus said, let's just define the relationship. Let's talk about what we've got going here. Jesus wanted them to be fully committed to him. So my question to you is, what are you here for? 
you can get totally into the routine of Sunday's church. And you can lose sight of being a follower of Jesus. And what the Lord really wants to hear from us is I'm here because your, my relationship with you is the thing that matters most to me and is central to my life. That's what Jesus is looking for. If any man's going to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus was looking for an absolute, total commitment to himself. And if we're not careful, we can glide along without that ever happening, or we can lose that intimacy of a relationship while we still go through the motions. Why are you still here? Why are you here? And then the second question to help, help us define the relationship is the question, are you all in? Are you all in? Sometimes when I'm doing weddings, and I've, I've done this for, I know for some couples that are here today, um, in the course of the ceremony, I'll, I'll, I'll say to them, you know, people sometimes ask me about marriage and ask me sort of what, what would I say to a couple, and I'd say, I say this, Marriage is, marriage is like going skydiving. And there comes the point where you've got to jump out of the plane. And whether you like it or not, you don't know quite where this is going to go. And you have no idea how it's going to end. But you are totally committed now and there's no going back. I say, that's, that's, that's like marriage. Or, or it's like strapping yourself into the biggest roller coaster you can imagine. And once the roller coaster starts going, you can't stop it and you can't go back. And whatever the ups and downs and the twists and turns, the fact is this, you are totally committed to the end of the ride. I say, it's like going to the cliffs in Acapulco to go cliff diving. And you're standing on the edge of the cliff there. And you're looking down. And the moment finally your toes leave the edge of the cliff, you can't change your mind. You're totally in. Jesus is looking for people that are all in. Fully committed. Maybe you're still sitting on the plane. Or you're still haven't fastened the belt for the ride or maybe you're on the cliff top just still looking down but what Jesus wants for us is to be fully committed followers of him all in a follower of Jesus will do whatever it takes to follow him a follower of Jesus will make Jesus priority and where he goes the priority there was a man came to Jesus at one point and he said to Jesus, uh, what have I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. You, you mustn't kill. You mustn't steal. And he said, yeah, I know the commandments. He said, he said, I've kept all of those from my childhood up. To tell you the truth, I think he probably just lied at that point. But anyway, you know. But he said, I've kept all the commandments since I was a child. And Jesus said to him, he said, okay, there's one more thing I'm asking from you. I want you to go and sell everything you've got and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And, and the Bible says the man went away and he was disappointed because he was very rich. Now, let me tell you this. Jesus was not setting there a principle that if, you've got to, if, you, if you're going to be one of his followers, you've got to sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. But he was saying to this one man, whose money was so important to him, if you really want to be one of my followers, then you've got to put away the thing that's number one in your life at the moment. And you've got to make me number one. All in. But the man wasn't willing to pay that price. At another time, Jesus was, uh, in Matthew chapter 8, it says, Jesus was talking to one of the followers that he had. And uh, he said to him, I want you to fully follow me. And it says, another, it says, 
He said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus replied, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> that sounds like really cold, doesn't it? But you've got to recognize the fact that um, in, in that day, in that era, and in that climate, people were either buried the day they passed or the next day. Usually the day they passed. So actually, if he said, let me bury my father, the chances are his father actually wasn't dead. And he was saying to Jesus, you know, once my father has passed, I'll be able to fully follow you. You know what? You can go through a whole lifetime saying, when I get to this stage, I'm going to fully commit myself to Jesus. When I've got this right, I'll fully commit to Jesus. And before you know it, you're laying on your deathbed. There's only one time to make the commitment to fully follow Jesus, and that's the time that we've got. And the only time we've got is here and now, isn't it? So in the here and now, to become fully committed to following Jesus. Because he wants to be more than a convenience to us. He wants to be more than a useful person to have. Like my AAA card is in my wallet. That's there because if all else fails and I can't get a hold of one of the friends that I'd call and harass first, <laughs> I got AAA there for security. Jesus doesn't want to be our AAA card. He wants to be the one who's the center of our lives. Fully committed followers of Jesus. Fully committed followers. Because you can't pick and choose in a real relationship with Jesus. Some, you know, some folks are, you know, they, they, they hold on to stuff that they, you know, I, yeah, fine, you know, I want to I follow Jesus, I want to serve Jesus, but I, you, you know what, I just can't forgive this person. I want to fully follow Jesus. Why do you keep saying tithe? Stop it. I want to fully follow Jesus, but you know what? I've got a lot of other things that are in my life as well that I've got to take care of. I want to fully follow Jesus. Yeah, but, but, but you know what? Uh, yeah, I know this relationship is wrong, and I know the Bible says I shouldn't be in this relationship. I want to fully follow Jesus, but, but the fact is this. If you're fully following Jesus, there are no buts. Fully following Jesus. Chris, you got a second? I'm not going to embarrass you too much. Can you come up here for me? Did I just embarrass you, brother? This is a good man. Chris, I want you to follow me. You turn. Oh, nearly got you. Did he follow me? Yes. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Do you get the point? If you're going to follow, you follow. You're either following or you're not following. It can't be I'm following and I'm, you know, you can't, you can't be half-hearted if you're following Jesus. If you're following Jesus, you're following in totality. If you are picking and choosing, and it's like a pick and mix thing, one from this section, one from this section, one from this, nah, don't do that. Sum is up with the picture. So as we ask the question, are you a fan or a follower? It is a very valid thing to ask are you all in? Are you fully committed? Or are there parts of your life that you're keeping for yourself and still living your way? That's God's way. This is my way. That's God's stuff. That's my stuff. In 55 B.C., Julius Caesar invaded England. And when they, their boats arrived on the shore of England, he instructed his commander to burn every one of them. 
because as far as he was concerned for him and his army there was no going back you know what that means that means two things that means there's a good chance that part of me is Italian that's why I talk this way but what it meant was we are totally committed to this and there is no going back and today I'm just believing God's going to encourage some of you here to take the step forward that says you know what I'm going to be a complete totally committed follower of Jesus are you all in and then the third question is this have you made it your own what's that mean well I'll tell you what it means you'll find a lot of people in churches who have drug problems they were drugged to church from the time they were that high they didn't want to go but they were drug along and they were drugged to church whether they wanted to be in church or not be in church and 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 that's been the pattern of their lives all along and you might be sitting here today you could be sitting here as a teenager and and you're here today and 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 the truth is Part of you wants to be here because you enjoy what goes on and you're meeting your friends here. But the fact is, you can be here and it's just become part of what you do, but you've never owned or had a relationship with Jesus for yourself. You can be here and your spouse started coming and your spouse asked you to come and you came here to be with your spouse. And, and the fact is, you enjoy being here and you've got to know some people here. And it's a pretty cool crowd that we get in here on a Sunday morning and it's a pretty good place to be. But the reality is, you haven't made relationship with Jesus your own. It's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like somebody picks you up to go to work every day and they, you know, they love Aerosmith and you're not an Aerosmith fan, but they're playing Aerosmith every single day. Uh, and then you find one day you're at work uh, and you're humming, I don't want to miss a thing. And it's, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm like a little bit of a fan, I guess. I'm a secondhand fan. And this can't happen in church. It can't happen with a real relationship with Jesus. The foundation of everything needs to be that I am a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If your faith isn't your own, if you're not pursuing your relationship with Jesus for yourself, then the fact is, if you're not careful, you're settling for a faith that isn't a faith. You may be the biggest fan, but you're not really a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua made this statement back in the Old Testament one time. He, 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 said, he said to the people of Israel, he said, I want you to choose which way you're going to go and, and, and who, you're gonna be, who, who you're going to be loyal to. But he said, but as for me and my house will serve the Lord. He said, as for me, as for me. What's your as for me this morning? What's your as for me? As for me, I will serve the Lord. Whoever brought you, whoever you're with, what coming, but I'm not talking to them or about them. I'm talking to you and about you. You know, are you in the place where you can say, well, as for me, I am going to serve the Lord. It's time to make your faith your own. Jesus is looking for a relationship with every single one of us, not a second-hand relationship through another family member or a friend. Luke 14 and verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let me explain that one quickly. Jesus is not, the, the, the word translated hate there is not really hate as we would understand it. You know what Jesus is saying there? If anybody comes to me and doesn't put me above, love me first, over father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, they can't be my disciples. Because followers of Jesus make Jesus number one. You can't follow me 
and have you focus on a bunch of other things. It's got to be following Jesus first and making Him your focus. So the question of the day is, are you a fan or are you a follower? And we're going to unwrap that some more in the weeks to come, especially on Tuesday night. I really want to encourage you to be with us for the next six Tuesday nights. Um, the series we're going to be showing is quite phenomenal. It is, it, is an out, it is an outstanding thing that has been put together. It is a story that will touch your heart and challenge your thinking. So if you're not normally here, and I know, uh, heck, sometimes on a Tuesday night, I'm thinking, I really don't want to go out again, and I'm the pastor. But I want to encourage you to be here. 7.15, we'll be done by about 8.15 to 8.30, definitely by 8.30. I want to encourage you to be here, and let's work through this whole thing. Am I a fan or a follower? You may have been here as somebody who sat in our church or other churches for quite a period of time, but you've never really made a personal commitment to Jesus. You don't have to wait till the end of the series. You could do that here today. You may be somebody who once was following Jesus closely, but as you examine your relationship in the light of God's Word, you'd have to admit that where you are today is you're more of a fan than you are of a follower. And as the band comes back up, I want to encourage you to make some of the words of this closing song your commitment today. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Let's stand and pray. Father, I thank you today that you talk to us because you want the absolute very best for us. I thank you, Lord, because you care enough to talk to us and to call us to follow you. You want us to be your disciples. You want us to be your followers. Father, I pray for everyone here this morning, for those listening online. And God, I pray that, Lord, not a single person will be robbed of a real relationship because they thought the role of a fan was all there was to it. Help us all, God, I pray, to live as fully committed followers of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Tom.